overlap here. Um, so I wanted to be able to give a, um, uh, I've been asked to give some real world examples of uh, device development as it pertains to interventional radiology. And hopefully folks can take something from that and um, apply that to their own innovation experience. And uh, again, my, um, my screen has gone from my talk to just showing me, which is not what you want to see. You want to see my slides. Okay. All right. So um, we're going to go through, um, in the allotted time here, we're going to go through two clinical examples of uh, having technologies that meet unmet needs and uh, were brought to market and uh, have resulted in products that are, are um, providing care uh, or solutions to assist care uh, through um, innovations that have been developed sort of organically are now used around the world. So I wanna be able to take you through the process that um, those of you have uh, attended the other uh, biodesign sessions, beginning with concept, through development, through commercialization. And um, I had a number of examples to take you through, but I think in the interest of time, I think it's probably best if we consolidate on two um, examples. And one is a hemodialysis catheter. The second is a hemostasis device. So I'll just uh, advance the next slide. So beginning with the hemodialysis catheter example, this is an extremely ubiquitous problem. Uh, nearly, actually it's closer to 600,000 patients in the United States are on, on hemodialysis. And for various logistic reasons, the majority of these folks begin dialysis um, with a catheter because they haven't had a surgical access created in their arm uh, and there's time that takes to create that access and then time that it takes to mature. So um, they need a dialysis catheter for urgent, so-called urgent start hemodialysis. And then for patients who are already on hemodialysis, 15 to 20% will ultimately have no usable venous access for uh, creation of a new access because they've had prior shunts that have failed. And the catheter that they have is their literal lifeline. When their catheter access ends, they have no means of getting hemodialysis. They're not a candidate for peritoneal dialysis. They're not a candidate for uh, renal transplantation. And so that, that becomes what is the factor that determines their, their lifespan. The problem is dialysis catheters are, uh, unlike their counterparts of uh, hemodialysis fistulas or grafts, the catheters are much more prone to infection, thrombosis, and inadequate fluid exchange, which um, determines solute clearance, which is what we're trying to do in, in dialysis, is to uh, clear un unwanted solutes, uh, both low and high molecular weight solutes, and uh, cleanse the blood uh, from things such as urea. So dialysis catheters, uh, I'm sure everybody in the audience is, is familiar with, they're all the same, except for the tip. And the tip is where fluid exchange occurs. And during dialysis use of hemodialysis catheters, there are high flow conditions. 400 milliliters per minute is typical. There can be catheters that are capable of achieving higher than that. And what happens is when you exchange blood through a catheter at flow rates that are vastly higher, than what would be done through a typical intravenous line or pick line or port or phoresis catheter is it produces immense near wall uh, shear stress factors uh, with non-laminar flow patterns. And this leads to platelet activation, 
um, thrombosis and uh, ultimately a biofilm. The biofilm serves as a nidus for infection. And as you have clot uh, building up, that occludes the lumen and you lead to poor fluid exchange, poor blood exchange, and that leads to diminished efficiency of hemodialysis. So um, how do you solve this problem? This has been a perennial problem since hemodialysis catheters have been around. And what you can do is take a lesson, as so often is the case in biodesign, is you look at what has the human body already done for you through billions of years of evolution to get around that problem. And if you can create a phenomenon of spiral laminar flow, which decreases near field shear stress and creates a more organized, less stressful environment for the rheology, if you will, the flow of blood flow, um, that becomes a protective effect. So you wanna have maximal amount of laminar flow and decrease turbulent flow patterns, and as a result, decrease platelet activation, thrombosis, and poor flows. Here's an example um, of an encoded MRA scan uh, the carotid bifurcation, and spiral laminar flow, which um, you can see this example here in uh, path lines from computational fluid dynamics, this carotid bifurcation is serving as a means of creating resultant spiral laminar flow in the internal and external carotid arteries, and this is a protective effect to keep us from developing carotid artery stenosis. This phenomenon has been described in the renal arteries and the aorta, not so much in the venous system, but it very much exists in both the arterial and venous system. So in solving this problem, as far as the uh, process, um, you identify the means of designing the optimal interface of the tip of the dialysis catheter. And the old way, the conventional way, is you build a bunch of prototypes you would uh, test them in a bench model of hemodialysis at those resultant flow rates of 400 milliliters per minute. And then you would iterate that to um, the optimal model or models. And then you would test those in an animal model. And then from there, you would move on to what would ultimately be your clinical catheter. And in the course of doing that, you would measure flow rates, dialysis pump speeds, arterial and venous pressures within the dialysis circuit, and uh, recirculation. And recirculation is an important concept in dialysis because it means already dialyzed blood is going through the dialysis circuit, through the membrane, through the, through the machine, and thereby diminishing the efficiency of hemodialysis. So you wanna have the least amount of recirculation possible. The problem is that in the conventional way of doing this, this iterative testing for an optimal dialysis catheter design takes years because of the lack of accuracy and reproducibility in bench testing and animal models. So the way you can get around this is through the use of computational fluid dynamics. And CFD simulates fluid passing through or around an object. As you can imagine, it's very computationally intensive, requires supercomputers or clusters of smaller high power computers, but this has really transformed the R&D in the automotive and aerospace industries. It's also had a huge impact and an even growing impact in that of medical device design, particularly medical devices that are prone to mechanical forces, repetitive mechanical forces. And what we can all envision is a medical device that undergoes repeated mechanical forces are those that are constantly in the vascular system. So examples like a bi leaflet, a heart valve, an aortic stent graft, a TAVR valve, an EVAR system, a mechanical stress, on a peripheral or coronary stent. These are all things that have been fundamentally affected by the use of computational fluid dynamics. So in the course of developing a improved dialysis catheter that overcomes these problems of platelet deposition, um, thrombosis, biofilm formation, um, what I did was to 
undergo literally years working with two very accomplished um, uh, bioengineering labs in Europe um, in iterative process to result in what would be the optimal hemodialysis catheter design. And that would be a catheter that would create spiral laminar flow, first and foremost. Secondly, would create flow that deflects away from the long axis of the catheter so that this is blood that's already been dialyzed. And on the opposite side of the catheter is blood that hasn't been dialyzed and has to enter the catheter to be dialyzed. So you want to have little to no admixture, so-called recirculation of that blood, to optimize the efficiency of hemodialysis. And what you want to have is a, a gradient of velocities and vectors as blood enters and leaves the catheter to minimize that phenomenon of platelet activation and platelet adherence, thrombosis, biofilm formation. And then ultimately test that in a bench model of a right atrium, which is where the tip of the of a dialysis catheter is typically placed. Here's one such uh, experiment where you can see that the flow is being deflected by this prototype catheter away from the long lumen towards the right ventricular outflow. Here's an animal model where we did three-dimensional uh, CTA showing the same phenomenon occurring. And ultimately, this led to parameters that we could use to optimize the characteristics of the catheter. Because if you change the angle of a flow deflecting interface of the tip of the catheter, it can alter these parameters by huge amounts. So we looked at shear stress, we looked at the uh, um, characteristic of causing platelet lysis, which then leads to platelet activation and aggregation. And we looked at blood resonance time, which is basically the amount of time that blood uh, hangs inside, the hang time, if you will, inside the catheter, which is an independent metric of the risk of thrombosis. And the uh, catheter under development, the so-called vector flow catheter, was highly favorable in all of those parameters. And this was through this iterative process with computational fluid dynamics. From there, we were able to go to a bench and preclinical model to validate what was shown in the computational fluid dynamics testing in terms of recirculation, which is uh, uh, less recirculation is the more favorable characteristic at flow rates vastly exceeding what would be used for clinical hemodialysis, the catheter under development, the so-called vector flow catheter, outperformed all of the other catheters on the market. And similarly, in a uh, uh, animal model, similar, similar patterns were seen where the recirculation was uh, basically absent in, in all of the uh, flow uh, rates that were achieved. So as a result, we ended up um, with a catheter that had a uh, spiral laminar flow. So we were able to, um, I say, I'm saying we, uh, this is me with the support of my family um, and encouragement of friends and colleagues, um, we're able to uh, emulate this phenomenon of spiral laminar flow entering and exiting the catheter. And this, in turn, minimizes that phenomena of platelet activation, activation and thrombosis and minimizes recirculation. So at this point, what happened? Have a catheter that you've spent years iterating to an optimal configuration, and literally one difference in the degree of this helical-shaped tip that deflects the flow enough to create a sufficient pattern of spiral laminar flow, but not too much that it creates a so-called sidewall suck phenomenon that can occur if you're aspirating blood close to the superior vena cava. And that was a highly iterative process. It took years. Uh, so once all of this has been achieved, what, what then happens next? Well, I would hate 
folks on this um, uh, session to come away with anything but a highly realistic appraisal of the amount of time and effort it takes to get medical devices to the market. And I would just say parenthetically that 94% um, of patented medical devices, devices for which there's a, a, a United States patent, 94% never make it to the market. 6% make it to the market. And of those, the number that uh, make it to a successful prolonged commercialization that solve clinical problems or, or add to solutions in clinical problems is even smaller. And it's a huge amount of work. Um, so, and it's a huge amount of time and it's not for people who are uh, potentially uh, wanting to see a return of their efforts a validation of their efforts in a very short term because that's not reality. So I invented this catheter in 2001. There are people, um, lots of people who were very, very young in 2001 who were on this call. The intellectual property filed to the United States Patent Office wasn't until 2004. And that has largely to do with the inertia that most academic medical centers have in translation of intellectual property and ideas into um, uh, patent applications. The process I described in the preceding slides of computational fluid dynamics, that occurred over a period of six years. It takes months to do each one of these simulations. And then you tweak it to optimize the parameters and, and run the whole set again, you can imagine how that's gonna add up to six years. The first patent for this catheter was issued in 2009, and I licensed the technology to Andrew Dynamics, which is a medical device company based out of Latham, uh, New York, uh, which makes a lot of uh, vascular interventional devices. And they had performed additional validation and testing after that licensure in preparation for the 510k they did a great job they had a very very nimble team they did some very high resolution testing and validation but because the tip was so different when you make a hemodialysis catheter it's basically a double d extruded um, uh, polyurethane tube that is cut and then you can use a tool to skive uh, holes on the side or skive an aperture on the side or you can laser cut it uh, but it's all a matter of uh, either by um, tool stamping or laser skiving um, creating that in the double d configuration and they found that the tip of this catheter called the vector flow catheter was too unique and after a year from the licensure agreement they said they were still trying to figure out how to make it so a little bit after that, they came back and said, well, we've reached an impasse. We've fallen behind in our milestones and we're gonna to have to return as part of the licensure agreement. We're gonna to have to return the IP back to you. So uh, I knew this is gonna be a great catheter, uh, but I knew it was gonna require advanced catheter technology to manufacture. So went back out looking for a commercial partner and licensed it to Teleflex in 2012. They then repeat, repeated independently all the prior validation and testing that I had performed and Angio Dynamics had performed, and of course, that took time. Um, they were able to develop a proprietary uh, technique for uh, creating the unique uh, helical tip of the catheter. And following that, they uh, filed and then shortly thereafter received the FDA approval through the 510K mechanism. The product though, if you notice, here's another three years that's gone by. Product did not launch into, until 2015. And that was just in the United States. Subsequent to that, there have been launches in uh, Europe, Middle East and Africa, Canada, uh, India, China, Australia, 
And then one of the hardest devices to uh, hardest markets for a medical device launch is in Japan. So it's now sold around the world, but you can see that the uh, time frame here for 2020, and there's been a huge amount of time that's evolved. Since it launched, the clinical studies that validated the computational fluid dynamic studies have come out, and they have shown that as far as cleansing of blood, the so-called KT over V, uh, which is an independent predictor of patient survival in patients who have uh, who depend on hemodialysis catheters for uh, for their hemodialysis access um, exceeds that of every every other catheter on the market, as does flow, as does the infection and thrombosis rates. All hemodialysis catheters are prone to thrombosis and all are prone to infection, uh, but the vector flow catheter has the lowest rates of both of those events. Ultimately, it's level one data and a randomized trial comparing it to a predicate device of the uh, palindrome symmetrical, symmetrical tip dialysis scatter uh, was published this year in JVIR. And this found that the critical parameter of KT over V, which is the efficiency of human dialysis and an independent predictor of patient survival, was 25% higher than the palindrome at 90 days, which was the endpoint of study. The um, catheter infection rate was uh, more than double in the uh, palindrome uh, subjects and the need for removing the catheter and exchanging it for a new catheter because of poor flows uh, was also uh, double, nearly double that in the uh, comparison catheter. So, the reason I kind of wanted to show this in this biodesign series is that um, in reality, the process of product development, meeting an unmet need, going through the process of development, iteration, design optimization, and then from there going on to the steps that lead to commercialization, that took 14 years. 14 years. From that point, it took another five years. So now we're up to 19 years to be able to sell this catheter around the world to have patients benefit from its advantages. That took 19 years. And that also included the time it took to get, there were, there were uh, studies I didn't mention that were retrospective studies, which are uh, helpful, but not sort of the gold standard of the randomized controlled trial. So having a prospective multi-center randomized controlled trial showing superiority of the catheter design, that was also within that five-year period. So nearly two decades. And um, so I, th I think the takeaway from this is that um, this was an example of a technology that uh, I developed had um, uh, gotten to a design freeze, a design optimization, had licensed it to ultimately a very large global, um, uh, you know, medical device company. And even with that, the latency of time it takes to get it out into benefiting patients is huge. So for those of you who are contemplating this, and I assume everybody is, because why would you be on this uh, webinar at this hour, you have to be very, very patient. All right, well, the second example I wanna take you through is a little different because the first involved what we've heard in other prior talks, and that is taking a, an idea, running with it, getting some IP, and then ultimately licensing it to a, an established, um, you know, uh, medical device company. What if you're going to take a device and you think that the opportunity for it to benefit patients is so great that you're going to create a medical device company around that and start a medical device company? Anyone on this call who would like to do that, I would be happy to write you a requisition for a uh, cerebral brain MRI. I have my prescription pad 
uh, right here. Uh, it'll be with contrast, just so we don't miss anything. Um, but all joking aside, I just want to let everybody know this, should you choose to undertake this, please don't underestimate the amount of time and effort it takes to do so. So in my career uh, around, I've uh, been doing this for over just a little over two decades, so about 22 years. Um, and around the mid uh, sort of 2005 to 2008 period, it became very clear that there was going to be a, a growing need for arterial procedures that were not performed through the femoral artery. The femoral artery is prone to issues with the section, uh, occasionally uh, retroperitoneal hematoma, which although very rare when it occurs can be absolutely life-threatening. And there were more safe and readily scalable means of doing various vascular procedures. And those, through, those were through non-femoral or so-called extra, extra femoral arterial sites of hemostasis, principally the radial artery, because all of us have two of them. And so um, there are currently half of all radial artery catheter, uh, uh, coronary artery catheterizations are done through the radial artery, and this continues to grow and is expected to plateau at around 70 to 80 percent in line with the rest of the world. Brachial artery catheterization is also used for PAD, for uh, chimneys and snorkels and so forth during uh, complicated EVAR and TVAR. Uh, neuroprotective devices that are used during um, TAVR uh, uh, insertions, so core valve and um, um, you know similar devices that are used for aortic stenosis. Uh, in the course of insertion or valvular predilation can lead to uh, cerebral vascular events. And so there are transradial neuroprotective devices that have been developed in the interventional radiology space. We're all familiar now with endoarterial venous fistula creation for hemodialysis. And those are now used, uh, albeit potentially off-label, but are used for uh, transradial access um, and, and on-label transbrachial access. And then there's a whole CLI use for transtibial and transpedal access. And the problem is hemostasis times for these smaller arteries actually takes longer because the sheath sizes are the same. And yet the vessel sizes are, the, are, are so much smaller. You know, radial artery may be only 2.5, um, you know, 2.5 millimeters in diameter compared to an eight millimeter femoral artery. And so that six French or seven French sheath as a uh, proportion of the vessel wall circumference occupies a huge pizza slice, if you will, of that vessel wall. And so that amount of endothelial injury and vessel violation is so much bigger that the time to hemostasis with manual compression is so much more so than it would be for femoral access. So that's why, um, you know, there's a need for hemostasis devices for these additional vascular territories. The problem is femoral devices, which use um, clips or uh, little uh, microsurgical suturing devices or a uh, polyolactic acid and, and collagen plug, you can't really scale those so far uh, readily to the size of radial and pedal and tibial. A um, little bit more for brachial, but that's a little bit smaller application. But for radial and tibial pedal, very hard to scale those devices. So you end up with uh, an array of devices that are just balloons, these so-called radial compression bands. And these are inflatable balloons that you blow up with a syringe and you have a Velcro pad that wraps circumferentially around the wrist and it applies pressure to the whole wrist, but a little bit more to the radial artery than it does to the rest of the wrist. 
And this has become the de facto way of achieving hemostasis in these vascular territories. Problem is, they're, as you can imagine, they're very uncomfortable. It's pressing the whole wrist. It's not a focused, precise pressure over the radial artery. As a result, because of this long segment radial artery occlusion, this has been associated with um, uh, long-term radial artery occlusion in as high as 30% of patients. When you go to deflate these balloons, if you deflate them quickly, they can lead to issues with rebleeding. So there's a uh, pretty time and labor intensive deflation protocol associated with these. It requires typically a dedicated syringe. So if you lose the syringe, you have to open up another device to get another syringe. And then there are untoward effects like pseudoaneurysm, compartment syndrome, nerve injury, and this is not surprising given that they're not selective and are uh, compressing the entire wrist instead of just over where it's needed, the point of entry into the radial artery. The FDA MOD database has a plethora of untoward effects that have been uh, reported, and um, uh, that includes things like hematoma, pseudoaneurysm, nerve injury, compartment syndrome, and even stroke from inadvertent injection of air through the vascular sheath. Pardon me one second. I'm just uh, confirming here that we are... We have a couple of questions coming through, uh, so I'll answer those as soon as those uh, come through. So these existing radial bands uh, produced by uh, multiple vendors have a lack of precision. They're compressing over the entire wrist, so that results in a long time to achieve hemostasis. They can lead to premature deflation of these balloons, leading to failure of the device. There's a very real phenomenon of occluding the radial artery so that if you have to go back into the radial artery in the future, um, that artery may no longer be open, and then there's the potential for nerve injury. Uh, if they're uncomfortable, uh, flow measurements have shown that you reduce the flow to the hand by 75%. You also reduce uh, venous return, so venous congestion occurs. Patients who have undergone uh, satisfaction scores have shown that this is the only thing they remember. They wake up after the procedure, all they know is they have a the device on their wrist, uh, and so this is reflected in patient satisfaction scores, and all, as a result of that, facility reimbursement. Um, and then from a workflow standpoint, as these balloons require a very uh, staged deflation protocol, um, it can result in an extended period before the patient is able to be discharged, and the patient has to be put into a dedicated splint or arm board sometimes and have a dedicated syringe for uh, uh, sequential deflation of the balloon. So in solving this kind of problem, and this is something as I started in my own career doing transradial procedures around 2007, um, I began to see that this was a real limitation. So if you had no device, it's pretty simple. What would you do? If you had no device, and you were walking along and, and, and you saw somebody in your lab who had a radial artery catheter and it all of a sudden popped out for some reason, they started bleeding, you'd rush over and you wouldn't say, get me a whatever device. What would you do? You'd do that. You would do manual compression. And really that's kind of the, the been considered the gold standard. Why? Because it's adjustable, it's precise. You're not applying compression to the entire wrist. You're implying, you're applying compression to just where it's needed and not to where it's not needed. You're not pressing over the radial nerve, the radial veins, the ulnar artery, the ulnar nerve, the dorsum of the wrist. You're, you're just applying it to where it needs to be that compared to these whole wrist compression devices. So if you were to take the physics of this and turn it into an ergonomic simple device that's very intuitive to use, that was the rationale and that's what led to the vasostat device, which has this ratcheting plunger, which basically is the thumb. It's the thumb. And this adherence to the wrist 
which is accomplished through these adhesive foot plates as well as an elastomeric pad that goes on top, that's your fingers. So you take your thumb, there it is, you can adjust it, you align it and adjust it, and the rest of the device so follows. So that became the vasostat. So you line it, you deploy it, there's an elastomeric bandage that goes across, which is like the rest of the hand holding compression. You can see through the device, so you can monitor and your, your nursing and technologist team can monitor the puncture site. It's convex on the, on the point of contact, just like your thumb or your finger would be. And so we've basically taken the physics of manual compression and reverse engineered it into a haptically intuitive uh, device, and that became the vasostat. So that's kind of what it looks like when uh, a patient is having sheath in place, the procedure has been performed, you place this elastomeric pad over top, you insert this uh, compressive plunger, you ratchet it down concurrently to removal of your sheath, and you have hemostasis. So very intuitive. This is an angiogram of a patient who underwent a complex multi-level upper extremity revascularization, which involved both brachial and radial access. The, the brachial access was maintained while the radial access was removed, allowing us to do a, an arteriogram in the radial artery. And look at the radial artery. Here is where the vasostat is. So we have perfectly preserved flow to the hand while the device is in place. No bleeding, no extravasation, perfect hemostasis. From an external physical exam standpoint, that's what it looks like. You have a palpable radial pulse distally. Fingers are nice and warm. Puncture site is visible, no bleeding. You can pleth the thumb or the index finger while occluding the ulnar artery to confirm that, or you can put your duplex here and confirm antegrade flow distal. So what we found is after launching this device is that as can so often occur, and you've seen examples of this and the other speakers, is that the market can kind of pivot. And what we found is that in the interventional cardiology market, uh, more and more people were using during complex percutaneous coronary intervention, particularly in patients who had, led, had left internal memory access graphs, and that's kind of how it started, because it's very hard to go up the right radial artery, go into the aortic arch, out into the left subclavian, and then pop down into the left internal memory, and then from there do an intervention. That's exceedingly difficult with current te catheter technology, whereas you can come up from the left side and hook the lima uh, much more readily. The problem is interventional cardiologists, like the rest of us, we all like routines and patterns, and interventional cardiologists like to always work from the right side of the patient. And so to be able to access the left arm, they have to lean over the patient. And that didn't work very well because you'd be wearing lead and then you'd have a very sore back at the end of the procedure. So they would then get a patient to reach across themselves and position their arm across so that it's on the right side. But if you try and do this yourself, imagine you've got your wrist facing upwards and you're reaching across towards your left femoral site where the operator is standing, you can't hold that position. But what you can do is you can hold your hand in a pronated position. And especially if somebody kind of tapes and supports your arm that way. And so that's how this whole dorsal snuff box field arose is that people found that you could comfortably position a patient with their left arm across their body to have the operator stand over on the right femoral region and not have to untowardly bend over too far to access the radial artery, but go in the anatomic step box of the radial artery in a patient with a pronated hand. So it just it's an interesting driver of how important and influential patient comfort and patient positioning is in a lot of the procedures that we do.
Subsequently, it was also found to have a lower risk of radial artery occlusion. And as a result, it was rapidly adopted initially in Japan, India, and then throughout the rest of uh, the world, including the US. And that was actually during the course of our device uh, development was quite a serendipitous event because all of the other balloon type devices failed miserably unless you dismantle them or tape them up with all kinds of cumbersome tape. And so the Vasostat device uh, conforms perfectly to the back of the hand for hemostasis of the dorsal radial or distal radial artery. The other thing that happened during the course of uh, development of this is that randomized trials were done. And uh, compared to the market leader, the uh, Vasostat was able to get in this trial uh, complete hemostasis 34 minutes faster than the Trumo device. And among, and that was in both diagnostic and intervention patients. And then among patients who were undergoing cardiac catheterization with intervention, uh, nearly uh, three quarters of an hour faster than the TR band. And you can imagine if you, um, if you amortize those time savings over the course of a busy day in say a busy cardiac cath lab, saving 45 minutes per patient per day, if you're doing 20 patients a day is a huge time savings. That means more time spots freed up, more patients that you can help, than if you were using a device that required longer times to hemostasis and discharge. And as with a lot of things in interventional radiology, in interventional cardiology, it's the same thing. There's a growing trend towards same-day discharge for elective procedures. It was also found that hand perfusion was higher with the Vasostat than the other device, and there was no radial artery occlusion. And that trial was published um, earlier this year. And then in a second randomized trial, it was fully an hour faster hemostasis with the Vasostat. And in this patient population, these were all patients who were undergoing same day discharge. So this translated into significant time savings in people going home. And then patient satisfaction scores were measured and patients were more satisfied with the more comfortable ergonomic device compared to the whole wrist balloon compression device. And nurses loved it because they had fewer device manipulations. They didn't have to keep going back and deflating, uh, you know, a balloon incrementally before they could remove a device. And there were no instances of radial artery occlusion. So we have this device that I've just shown you that um, answers a problem, addresses a problem in a more um, intuitive or ergonomic or haptically efficient model than the prior and it came to market and um, studies were done and then randomized trials were done and it all just happened in a couple of years. Uh, other studies were done. This was a, uh, a prospective study that was done in Japan looking at preservation of blood flow with the Vasostat device compared to, so you see preservation of the duplex waveform with patent hemostasis compared to the competitive device, which had basically a flat line. Radial artery occlusions, which were uh, substantially higher in the, in the other device compared to the Vasostat, which has the lowest rate of radial artery occlusion on the market. Uh, eventually, our users pivoted to, initial, in addition to using it for radial, they found that, well, this could be used in other territories, such as going through the foot, going through the ankle. Um, initially, we were aware of this happening. Of course, we couldn't promote this as it was off-label use, uh, but as it became clear that this was a significant benefit, we uh, filed an expanded 510K which specified that it uh, could be used for tibial or pedal artery catheterization. Of course, we needed the clinical data to support that justification, which, which we did. And if you're needing to do more than one tibial vessel, such as here in the PT and the dress salus pedis, uh, 
you can use multiple devices, which is very problematic with the other uh, balloon type devices. Uh, trying to sort of tape it up and, and get hemostasis can be pretty challenging. Uh, this is just the, another example of that same application of the uh, tibial perineal hemostasis. And again, we had uh, um, data to show that preservation of flow through the tibial vessels was achieved with the mesostat, whereas the uh, arrest of flow occurred with the uh, competitive device. So as far as the value proposition for this technology, for this device, pretty simple, pretty ergonomic. We're basically emulating what manual compression does. We have level one data through randomized trials showing rapid time to hemostasis, level one data showing it's more comfortable than other devices, has the lowest rate of radial artery occlusion of any device in the market, very simplified removal protocol, doesn't require protracted incremental deflation of a balloon. Uh, both the FDA and CE marked for, in addition to radial and ulnar, but also for brachial and transpedal. It can also be used uh, without modification on label for distal radial. So how did, how did this happen? Well, um, so I developed this device uh, initially in 2009, and then uh, with a couple of other folks uh, formed uh, initially an LLC and became a Delaware C Corp. Subsequently, uh, we pitched it to investors throughout 2010, 2011. Ultimately, uh, we succeeded in raising a Series A round from a uh, life sciences aligned Wall Street um, investor group, um, 2012. Um, I am just a simple guy who grew up in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. So for me, to be on the 64th floor of seven um, world place, you know, sort of the World Trade Center uh, with floor to ceiling windows pitching to uh, executives from uh, JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs and so forth, and then to be battered with a litany of questions afterwards, um, that's that's like doing a bleeding tips patient, you know. Um, it's a, it's a pretty heady experience, but uh, ultimately it worked out okay. So we got our Series A raised, we got our intellectual property filed, we got a design freeze by 10K filed, was granted in 2013. Uh, we had started exhibiting at trade shows before we got our 510K just to kind of test the market. We weren't selling the product, obviously. It was blue then. Uh, first sales occurred in 2013. Then in the ensuing years, we got uh, a lot of interest from folks in Japan, the, the uh, home market, if you will, of our leading competitor. And it's now sold throughout Japan. We have a limited presence in Europe, in Berlin, and then uh, centers across uh, the United States. And these are just images from uh, various trade shows. Uh, this was Osaka. This was Tokyo. This was um, uh, Stuttgart in Germany. Uh, this was New Orleans. This was Las Vegas. So um, this is this is stuff that you're doing in addition to your to your uh, full time position, right? This is this is vacay. So running a medical device company um, is is you know this is this is work, folks. We're able to have uh, a lot of folks who are very enthusiastic and are enthusiastic, including these two randomized trials, but we had other case series that uh, described the use of this device and its competitive advantages to the other products. These were all investigator initiated. These were, uh, these were all people who just believed in the technology and thought it was better than what was out there and, and uh, took it upon themselves. Uh, to, to sort of share their experiences with their colleagues. But I can tell you that if you're running a medical device company, 
there's a lot of moving parts. And we're, we're not a Medtronic, we're not a Boston Scientific, uh, but it doesn't matter. You have to have the same infrastructure. You have to have the same quality management system. You have to comply with all of the same regulatory requirements. You have to pay the same regulatory fees as if you were a Medtronic, a Boston Scientific, and so forth. So we've got, uh, you know, manufacturing, we've got R&D, regulatory, both European and US, uh, from a, a, a company operational standpoint, we've got a board of directors. Um, uh, Clark's rule of medical device development, rule number one, lawyers will always make money. So, of course, we've got three different tiers of lawyers. We've got corporate lawyers, general legal contracts lawyers, and, of course, IP lawyers. So they all run the meter, uh, accounting and so forth, sales and marketing, uh, manufacturing. So um, if you're doing you know, a career like interventional radiology um, full time, and I'm in you know, an academic medical center, so we're constantly... You know, we're teaching uh, residents, fellows, medical students, trainees, uh, giving invited talks, writing papers, uh, coming up with new policies, protocols, sitting on hospital committees. You do all of that, that concurrent to this and a lot of moving parts here. So um, just a word to the wise, if you decide to get into this, you do have much more control than if you were to do a, a, a device that you develop and you license to an existing medical device company. So if you wanna go on your own, it's certainly doable. If I can do it, anybody can, but it's, it's a, don't ever underestimate the amount of work it takes. So that was kind of just a little horizon of our milestones. Uh, we founded the company back in the early 2000s, raised a Series A, uh, iterated to design freeze, got regulatory clearance, established our supply chain and our contract manufacturer supply or uh, filed for intellectual property. A year later, we uh, received our 510K. A year after that, we got our first US patent. We've got four since then and more pending. Our first commercial sale with our First generation device occurred in late 2014. Japanese approval occurred in 2015, followed a year later with our first commercial sale. We then, as people pivoted to transpedal and transtibial um, use, we expanded our 510K. We had a paper in, in uh, this journal to support that. We got European mark, uh, CE mark, and then uh, our ISO 13485, which is sort of the, uh, from a quality management standpoint, is the the the, the, the standard that you want to uh, achieve. We launched our Generation Two device, and then that was on the market for a time. And then in 2018, we launched our Generation Three device uh, again from customer feedback continuing to support our early U.S. and Japan customers, launched in Europe. We completed our first randomized trial, and that was investigator-initiated, not supported by the company. And again, that was just by the passion of the users who were using the device. Same thing with our second device. Uh, we got our uh, gold standard device, 13485 2016. We uh, renewed our CE mark, expanded our IP portfolio, and then I'm proud to say that we were used during the COVID-19 pandemic and continue to be used by the COVID uh, healthcare workers for uh, radial artery monitoring lines. As many of you know, well, everybody knows that critically ill COVID patients require pressure support and radial artery monitoring lines, and getting efficient hemostasis on those folks can be a challenge. So, so as far as an innovation timeline, this is kind of how we started, where it's at and where it's now. We got initial feedback. We incorporated that feedback in the next generation device. We saw our users independently pivoting to other applications. 
We concluded those applications into things we hadn't anticipated, so we got expanded regulatory approval, and then we saw further pivoting with use to what the market was uh, headed towards with uh, dorsal radial uh, anatomic snuff box access. So the, the challenges in biodesign, as closing remarks go, is that interventional radiology is an incredibly dynamic specialty. I consider myself um, to be extremely fortunate to be in a, such a dynamic and invigorating field. And part of that relates to the people who are in it. Uh, actually, a big part of it relates to the people who are in it. But um, it's also very um, exciting that there's this constantly evolving technology in interventional radiology. The reality is that the latency period from device inception or, or um, you know, solution to get that to commercial endpoint is at minimum five years. So how do any of us, you know, look down to the future and say, where are we going to be five years from now? What do we need five years from now? And it really is a challenge to kind of innovate for clinical solutions that we haven't even encountered the problems yet to know what we're going to need five years from now. There's this constant interplay, interplay between innovators uh, in the field and industry and end users, so it's a circular relationship to define and refine the roles of new technologies, and part of that is learning to pivot. As I hope I've been able to show you examples um, this evening. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for your insightful talk, Dr. Clark. If anyone has any questions, please type in the chat and Dr. Clark will We're get to them. still having um, so OK Boomer um, <laughs> audio issues here. So um, so um, Selena has very helpfully uh, texted me using the, the, the internet um, questions. Okay. So I'm gonna, I've been asked to read these aloud. Uh, so how do you deal with the discouragement in the extremely long design process? Uh, that's a great question. There is a lot of discouragement in device development and device iteration. Um, you know, looking at the prior uh, presentations in this, they cited a lot of things from this, this book here, part of the Stanford Biodesign Program. I was aware of the Biodesign Program at Stanford. I know people who are a part of that. My company's $1,200 an hour lawyer is mentioned in the index of this book multiple times and is the lawyer for multiple of these, multiple of these firms. Um, it's a little lawyer joke. Um, so I bought this book to kind of get a better understanding of the process. And I have to say, they've really laid this out really well. I would also say I didn't learn anything from this book that I didn't already know. But it took me 10 years of being in the field of device development to learn this. And I really wish I had this book 10 years ago. So anybody who's looking in the getting into this something like this, I, I would think this book is a great starting point. The other thing that I would recommend is uh, this book. Uh, this is one of my favorite podcasts, How I Built This, uh, NPR, Guy Raz, and uh, there are really no medical device uh, companies mentioned in here but all kinds of great companies, and it gives you insight into things that can face founders and innovators as they go through a, um, uh, through a founding process, where there will be periods of great inspiration followed by naders of great uh, discouragement. And I think what people can agree on is that if you work with someone else, as a team, you can kind of build each other up 
and complement each other's periods where one may feel a little bit uh, discouraged by something or the other person can complement something that the other person may not have. Uh, so that would be my recommendation. Let me go to the next question here. What advice would you tell your 20 year younger self? Any advice for budding entrepreneurs? Well, in the interest of time, uh, I'm gonna just solidify and simplify the medical device development process. So if you're comfortable with the following scenario, by all, by all means, please, please proceed. Go to Lowe's or Home Depot this weekend, buy the biggest wheelbarrow they sell and buy a pitchfork. Take those items back home. Go to the bank, take out all the money that you can get, not just from yourself, but friends, families, strangers. Take all of that money, stack it all up in $100 bills and put it in the wheelbarrow. Then go to a high-rise building on a windy day, throw open the nearest window, release all of the bills into the wheelbarrow, and start shoveling those bills out the window to have them drift 50 floors down to the street where they'll be caught by whomever and hopefully serve a good purpose. That's how medical device cash burns go in medical device companies. If you're okay with that, then that's fine. If you find that difficult scenario, then it, it may not be you. Um, so you have to be, um, you have to be very careful about that. Um, did you jump into these projects with a desire to make money? I'm in academia now for 22 years. Um, <laughs> I think that goes without saying that you don't do that to make money. Uh, I liken it like this. As an interventional radiologist, I get to help about 1,500 patients a year. I do about 1,500 procedures a year. Those are patients I directly impact. Through medical devices, you have the ability to benefit the healthcare and outcomes of people around the world. And so I, you know, the dialysis catheter, I developed the highest performing dialysis catheter in the market improved dialysis efficiency and clearance, that's a predictor of survival. People are less likely to get infected or have a thrombosis event, more efficient dialysis. I feel like I can walk into a soccer stadium of people a year and say, I've helped benefit in some small way your, your or your family members' outcomes. And your, and you know, my father who was an engineer and a dialysis patient. I have to say that that was a huge driver. So it's no, it's the passion. It's like wanting to be able to help people beyond your immediate sphere of your own practice. You do that through teaching, you do that through education, but medical device development is another way that you can benefit so many more people than you could ever come in direct contact with. Sorry, I have to keep putting the... Uh, Boomer glasses on to answer these questions. Um, oh, uh, I was folding up books and people couldn't see them. Um, okay, well, it, it, the book that I was holding up was the one that's been uh, cited in this whole um, series. The uh, Okay, here we go. So this book here, second version, second edition, this is from the Stanford Biodesign Group. It's a somewhat interventional cardiology centric uh, um, thing, but it's got a lot of really very helpful practical device. And, uh, you know, this, I wish I'd read this 10 years ago. That's called the, uh, it's called Biodesign, uh, 
by Yacht as the first author who came up with, I've subsequently learned the rapid exchange uh, coronary artery catheter profile and uh, intravascular ultrasound. And then how I built this by Guy Raz. This is the uh, NPR nerd who I um, think is incredible and has amazing profiles of people. Uh, he's got an amazing podcast and being the total NPR, I got the signed copy. Um, but uh, just, uh, it, it kind of goes through the cadence of device, uh, of company startup development that I think is really, really helpful to understand and appreciate and just the ebbs and lows, the highs and lows that can occur. Um, so I'd highly recommend it and it, it's pretty ex inexpensive book too. And the podcast is free. Okay, uh, so those are the books. Do you worry about your ideas being stolen? Uh, if so, what precautions were most important? Um, so I, I'm sure this has been addressed already, but yes, um, you, you, you do have to be careful. Um, so I just want to tell a couple of super quick stories. People say, well, when did you first come up with medical device uh, ideas? So I was a dorky um, medical student, second year medical student at the University of Alberta in, in uh, Alberta, Canada. I just want to shout out for my virology professor who's getting the Nobel Prize in Medicine this week. Very proud as, a, as an alumnus. So I thought, well, you know, here we are listening to people's lungs with a stethoscope, which is like, you know, we're just isolating a column of air and holding it to a patient. And so if you had a way of amplifying the sound from a heartbeat or lung breath, that would give you a better diagnostic ability. So how can you do that? Well, if you deform a piezoelectric crystal, piezoelectric crystal under deformation emits an electrical signal. If you amplify the electrical signal, you can then have an electronic stethoscope. So I won't bore you with the details, but I designed this prototype for an elect electrical electronic stethoscope I looked at the market and saw that the biggest manufacturer was 3M, i.e. Uh, Littman. I uh, sent all this stuff in the mail as a, as a medical student and um, got a very polite letter uh, a few months later. Dear Mr. Clark, thank you for your interesting idea. We will take it under consideration and we'll contact you should we decide this merits further um, exploration. Uh, a few months later, actually it was a year later, I'm on my clinical rotations in medical school. I go into our medical school bookstore to buy my first stethoscope and I see this little display for coming soon, electronic stethoscope. And it was from 3M and it was the exact same thing of a piece of electric crystal that with it with an amplifier uh it took the sound the vibrations from a stethoscope and amplified it so uh i'm sure they came up with that independently uh they have a lot of brilliant engineers and i was just a a, a silly dumb medical student but it does serve to say that yes you do need to be careful so if you do not have a patent filed or at least a provisional patent file, you have to have a non-disclosure agreement in place with any entity in which you are exchanging confidential information. It also serves to watermark all of your materials such as pitch decks, slides, executive summaries, business plans with confidential, as well as emails with confidential, just as another measure of security. If you are pitching to investors, should you decide to ignore my advice to get a, a head CT or a brain MRI and, and form a company on your own, uh, you will um, not be able to get any venture capitalist or angel investor to sign a, uh, a confidentiality agreement. It just does not happen. Uh, 
So you need to ensure that you um, uh, adjust your presentations and electronic information accordingly. So I hope that answered that. Um, how did you establish a good team of people around you, including the initial stages before finding and uh, then after? So it's been said by many, uh, and I think this is a valid point that the team is, is in many ways more important than the technology, if not as important, often more important. Uh, investors often say they bet on the jockey more than they do the technology. And, and I think that's a testament to the, um, the effort that it takes to get a technology in any space, medical devices, uh, uh, you know, tech, you know, whatever it is, the effort it takes to get it to market and succeed is, is huge. And you need a very nimble, innovative team to do that. So choosing your founders or co-founders is exceedingly important. Um, I, I would recommend vetting people so very carefully. Um, I would make sure that you have uh, absolutely um, personal references that you can vouch for over and over again, not just, um, oh, you know, so-and-so's got a great track record. I found them on LinkedIn or something like that. I just, these, these are people, you're, you, if you look at the, if you look at a medical device company from uh, um, inception to exit, recognizing that most of them are going to fail, the latency of that period is about seven to eight years. You are embarking on a long-term relationship with a founder, a co-founder for seven to eight years that you're going to be speaking evenings, weekends, holidays, you know, family time, precious time. Um, you have to trust each other. You have to build each other up when things aren't going so well. You need to trust that person absolutely um, at all times. And um, so you have to know them very well, very well or know somebody that you trust who knows them very well. So uh, I would just say tread very carefully with that uh, because, you know, having having had that experience where somebody didn't fit that bill and came involved and it, you know, didn't work out, um, just be very careful. What tips do you have in working with your technology transfer office? Uh, so if you're in an academic medical center, there are incredible strengths that that can provide you. And there are um, it's perhaps some disadvantages. The incredible strengths are you've got the uh, community of mentorship that's open to you. You've got people who have a tremendous amount of experience who can help to guide you through the process. Um, a lot of tech transfer offices that are in, um, you know, uh, academic medical centers have uh, incubator type models and, and funds uh, that are not necessarily dilutive funds. You can have non-dilutive financing that can help to get your uh, enterprise off the ground. Um, they have contacts that can lead to follow-on funding. So there's a tremendous amount uh, as a catalyst that can get your, your startup up and running or at least give some wind under your sails. Uh, the, um, the other advantage is that they can provide a lot of uh, financial help or file intellectual property uh, prosecution for getting patent prosecution. Um, uh, which, you know, my hemodialysis catheter, I disclosed to my university. The university said there was no need for another dialysis catheter, even though 14% per year, year of year growth was occurring in hemodialysis patients. So they returned the technology to me and I pursued that independently, but I did pay $200,000 in legal prosecution. That was for the first patent. We now have four U.S. patents and six international patents. So um, 
you know, you can imagine the expense of it doing that kind of adds up. Uh, so having the tech transfer office can really help to um, allay those. Um, but, the, you know, there is a split that occurs with the university. Um, and that's appropriate for a lot of people who develop technologies in wet labs, for example. If you're a, uh, you know, my son's a biochemist, you know, if you're a biochemist and you, you're using materials and reagents and everything, and centrifuges and electrophoresis systems and what have you, and you, you come up with a novel technology to uh, do something and you've used all the university resources and your postdocs and so forth have been instrumental in that, it's absolutely appropriate that there is a sharing mechanism with the university. That sharing mechanism is a little harder to apply when you're not using any direct resources of the university other than you going and working in your clinical capacity, which doesn't involve that. So, um, so you know, you sort of have to um, weigh the advantages and disadvantages of that. But of course, at all times, be compliant with your text transfer office requirements. Uh, a lot of academic medical centers will have a return to inventor mechanism so that if they acknowledge that they can't really provide you with resources that you need, um, that they will um, return the inventor, uh, re return the technology to you that you can then pursue independently and then you've met your obligation as far as dis disclosure goes. All right, another questions come come through here. Okay, I think, uh, all right. Well, thank you folks. I think that's reached the end of our questions. Uh, and uh, thanks everyone for uh, for your attention tonight. And I hope that's, uh, I hope that's been informational for you. And I just wanna commend uh, Celia and the other organizers of this, uh, you know, I think for, Anybody who's interested in medical device design and development, um, you know, the other speakers have been excellent. And I took a look at the, the forthcoming speakers and it's also excellent. So they're also excellent. So I think this will be a really, really helpful um, series of presentations for folks. All right, thank you. All right, so thank you everyone um, for your amazing questions. I just want to ask everyone to help us out with their initiative by filling out the post-webinar survey. Um, you will also receive an email with the link afterwards as well. I also want to give a quick plug for our upcoming webinar and our biodesign webinar series regarding entrepreneurship. So Dr. Bob Smoose, um, President and Director of Respiratory Motion, will be talking a little bit about steps and tips to protecting intellectual property, pitching to investors, and bring a product to market. So you can use this QR code here to register for the next webinar, or you can go to our SIR RFS Bio Design Center page to find out more about our webinar series. Um, so thank you again for joining us tonight, and a big thank you to Dr. Clark for your great talk. Have a good night, everyone.